see you guys. I uh, just want to welcome you here. Uh, feels like 11.30, but it's not. <laughs> uh, we're in the Gospel of Mark, and the passage I'll be teaching from can be found in Mark <laughs> chapter 4, actually chapter 5, sorry, chapter 5, verses 21 to 43. So Mark 5, 21 to 43. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. And he went with them. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him, and there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and, had, and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, he immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha, kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walk, walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Uh, today's uh, passage is about uh, God's um, multifaceted, multifarious uh, grace. Grace shown to a sick woman who had uh, drained almost her complete bank account in search for uh, some treatment that would heal her, who had been alienated from her society uh, because of her illness. Also, grace shown to a synagogue leader whose daughter was sick and dying. And ultimately, this passage is talking about the prospect of grace uh, av available to us if we just um, come in and try to reach out to Jesus in faith. So I have just given you the basic outline of the sermon. Okay? So I'm going to talk to you about three things. Okay? Grace given to the woman, grace given to the man, and the prospect of grace available to us. First, grace given to the woman. Now, what do we know about this woman? Well, we know that she's suffering from a condition that's causing uh, continual menstrual bleeding. And that was a huge problem in her culture because in her culture, that bleeding would have meant that she was unclean. 
There's a long passage in Leviticus that talks about women in her condition, which I'm not going to read to you because I, wanna, I don't want to bore you so early in the sermon. I'll bore you later, <laughs> but not so early. I want to spare you the boredom. But I can provide a little summary. Basically what it says is that women who have, who have a discharge of blood is unclean. Not only is she unclean, but everything she touches and lies down on is considered unclean too. And that meant she would have been completely socially isolated. She would have been ostracized. <coughs> because to touch this woman, or to touch anything that she sat on or lied down on, meant that you were unclean too. And you had to do ritual bathing and wait until evening to be declared clean again. And nobody would have wanted to go through that trouble. Right? Imagine, nobody, nobody would have wanted to invite her to their home to share a meal. She never got a, a wedding invitation. Right? She never took part in any of the Jewish national festivals, which were a big deal back then. Right? No Yom Kippur, no Hanukkah for her. She would have been completely on the outside of society looking in, and there was, this was going on for 12 years, 12 long, grueling, and lonely years. Now you get an idea of why she had to come up from behind Jesus, because she wasn't the type of person who could appear in public without drawing attention to herself from people who wanted to get away from her or who wanted her to get, to get away from them. But she thought if she touched Jesus or touched even his garment, that somehow miraculously, magically, she would be healed. And by the grace of God, it happened. Right? She was healed. She felt something. She felt something in her body that made her think she was well again. And Jesus felt something too. Jesus felt power leave him. Okay? I don't know how that worked. You know? it just... <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't know how, what Jesus exactly felt, but he felt power leave him. And when he feels this, he turns around, he looks around for the person who touched him. And this is uh, really the thing that I want you to see and take notice of at this point in the story. After the woman is healed, Jesus doesn't permit her to kind of creep away by herself, you know, back to her home, you know, without making an effort to, to find her and talk to her. You know, it, it would have been easy for Jesus to do this, right? To, you know, crowds pressing around him. You know, there was an urgent matter of Jairus' daughter needing healing. It would have been easy for him to let this woman slink off by herself. But despite all the commotion and the urgency of the situation, Jesus searches for the woman. Why? Well, because he wants to say something to her. And what does he say? Well, first he calls her daughter. He gives her a new identity. And then he blesses her. Right? Go in peace. It's a Hebrew blessing. And then he reassures her that her faith is permanent. He says, be healed of your disease. And through this conversation, he is placing her inside the community of God's people. He is placing her inside the community of God's people. <coughs> you know, she'd been outside for 12 years. Right? She'd been excluded from the community of God's people. She'd been excluded even from the worship of God because she wouldn't have been able to attend the local synagogue to worship <coughs> God. She was a pariah in her community. Nobody ever looked for her. But Jesus looks for her and gives her welcome. You know, this story is reminiscent of another story in the Bible, the story of Zacchaeus, the, the tax collector. Zacchaeus was a tax, tax collector, which meant that he was also a social outcast. And what does Jesus do? Jesus sees him hanging from a tree, which he had climbed to get a better view of Jesus as he was passing by. And Jesus calls out to Zacchaeus and says, Zacchaeus, I must stay at your home. Okay? That's scandalous for Jesus to stay at a sinner's home. And Zacchaeus comes down and receives him joyfully. And later Zacchaeus stands up and announces to Jesus that he's going to give up half his wealth. And if he has defrauded anyone, he's going to pay them back fourfold. And what does Jesus say about him? He says, he too is a son of Abraham. 
this woman suffering from bleeding and considered unclean by everyone around her. This woman, too, is a daughter of Zion. They're social outcasts. Right? They're on the fringes of society. Right? They're marginalized people of society, but Jesus gives them acceptance and welcome. So the question that we should ask, do we exclude people? Do we exclude people? You know, Jews, the Jews did it for their set of reasons. We do it for a different set of reasons. Right? For example, in a traditional culture, that, like the culture that most of us have grown up in, right, Korean culture, with very, very rigid rules about how one is expected <coughs> to behave or, or dress or talk, especially in a place like church, it's easy to exclude people who don't do those things like we do. I've sometimes uh, wondered what would happen if a transsexual cross-dresser ever came into a church in Vancouver. Not that anybody like that would ever would. They wouldn't dare. But imagine such a person finding his way into a church service in Vancouver. How would Christians treat him? Treat him? What would we say about him behind his back? What would would he, what would we think about him? What would you think about him? You know, I, I live um, in the downtown east side. Well, not really in the heart of downtown east side, but near downtown east side. And I see a lot of people in my neighborhood that, well, let's say they're just a little strange. <laughs> they don't fit into society. They're meth addicts. They're alcoholics. They're mentally ill. And it's easy to look down on some of the people in my neighborhood. I even caught myself doing it. And see them as being different, right? somehow subhuman, less than human. <coughs> They're inferior human beings. And that's how the wider society thinks about them. That's how the wider society treats them. But Christianity says something about, it, about them that is utterly transformational in how we look upon people, all people. What does it say? It says they're made in the image of God. They're made in the image of God. You know, animals such as dogs, cats, dolphins, horses, they're not made in the image of God. Human beings are made in the image of God. They're not just biological sacks of chemicals. They're made in the image of God. They're not just accidents of random chance. They're made in the image of God. So we need to see them differently from how mainstream society sees them. But that's just one side of the coin. You know, the other side of the coin is that if you're a Christian, you need to see your calling differently. Do you know what the Bible says about our calling? The Bible says that we are a kingdom of priests. We are a kingdom of priests. What do priests do? Well, they mediate God's presence. Right? We are to be priests to one another. We are to mediate or minister God's power and presence, forgiveness and mercy, goodness and kindness to one another. You know, in the Catholic Church, people confess their sins to priests. Right? And we Protestants have said, no, 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 we don't do that. Okay? Right? We say, you know, we don't, we don't need a priest because we have Jesus. Jesus is our true priest. We can go to God directly through Jesus. Right? We can confess our sins directly to Jesus. We can receive forgiveness directly from Jesus. But I know that there are people in society, because I was one of them, and I know people like this, who are so burdened by a feeling of guilt and shame that they can't be free from it until someone hears and understands their story and tells them it's okay. <coughs> God forgives you. You're welcomed here. Don't you think that's right? Isn't it true that sometimes after committing the, set, the same sin for the seventh time in the past week, you begin to wonder, 
will God forgive me this time? Will he really forgive me? But then to hear someone who knows you and understands you say, yes, God forgives you. Doesn't that give you the extra reassurance that you need? See, for the guilt-ridden, God seems far away. (coughs) They don't feel God. They don't have a sense of God. (coughs) But you're near. You're near them. You can be a minister of God to them. You can be the voice of God's forgiveness to them. You can be the hand of God's mercy to them. You know, it's one of the reasons we have cell groups. I know they don't always work that way, okay? But these cell groups are intended to be places of ministry. Do you know the purpose of these groups? It's not just about fellowship. It's not just about getting together and having fun, although that's part of the purpose. But the primary (coughs) purpose is is to minister to one another. And we all need this. You know, I need this. Now, I've often thought, you know, I, I need a cell group. I need people to speak into my life, to pray for me, to kind of minister God's presence to me because sometimes I don't feel very close to God. And I need His ministry. I need a more tangible sense of His reality and His presence in my life. And the reason I don't join is because you guys are so far away. And I don't want to make you guys feel uncomfortable. But I do need this. And as you meet for your cell group, if you belong to one, as you meet, you should be coming to each meeting with a desire and expectation. An, ex- an expectation to meet God, <coughs> to minister to one another, a desire to bless the people in your cell group, to say a word, to give a prayer, to, to do something so that the other members can feel closer to God. Do you see then that what I'm describing here is exactly what Jesus was doing for this woman. Jesus was ministering to this woman. And what Jesus did for this woman, we have to do for one another, for the people both inside and outside our community. Okay, so now let's move on. Let's look at what happens because of the delay as a result of Jesus ministering to this woman. So what happens? Because Jesus uh, was delaying, Jairus' daughter dies. So during the interval that Jesus spends um, looking for and talking to this woman, a report comes back to Jairus saying that his daughter is dead. And Jesus is too late. Don't bother Jesus anymore. And Jairus' hope is dashed to pieces. But Jesus looks at Jairus and says to him, don't be afraid, just believe. What Jesus is saying to Jairus is basically this. He's saying, your assessment of the situation based on the way things appear shouldn't rule out your faith in me. Keep believing. Now, can you imagine what Jairus might have initially felt because of Jesus' delay? My daughter is sick. My daughter is sick. Why aren't you coming? Okay, why are you wasting your time talking to this woman? I think he would have been very impatient. He would have felt upset that things were not unfolding as he wanted or expected them to unfold. <coughs> but as you can see from the story, God had other plans. Jesus eventually does go and see Jairus' daughter. But he doesn't heal the girl of her disease. He does something even more remarkable. He raises her from the dead. Which, if you think about it, would have resulted in even greater relief and joy for the parents. Now, I think it's almost a truism to say that God doesn't follow our plans. You know that. Right? That's pretty obvious. But let me say it a different way. Okay? God can come out of left field and do something that we couldn't have or wouldn't have planned or even thought of. But we saw in something truly remarkable, truly amazing. Um, Does that sound trite? I was worried that it might sound trite. Well, even though it might sound trite, it is true. 
is true. And the best, best example I can give you is Jesus. Do you know how the whole story of the gospel can be summed up? Okay. It can be summed up like this. God did something in and through Jesus that no one in Israel, and really no one who ever lived, would have expected or thought of. No one in Israel was expecting the Messiah to be born in a stable, right? No one was expecting him to grow up in a backwater town of Nazareth with a father who was a carpenter and a mother who had a reputation for having given birth to a child out of wedlock. Everyone was expecting a, a military messiah with power and glory. Right? So, something like a Jewish Caesar Augustus who would you know, come in and kick the Romans' butts. But they got a Jesus who wasn't any of that. Instead, they got somebody who looked out for outcasts and died as an outcast. You know, even the disciples who'd been with Jesus uh, for three years, you, you expect them to get it, right? They met you with Jesus for three years. But they had no idea what Jesus was on about. <clears throat> right? They were clueless too. And just to show you how clueless, they were told explicitly by Jesus, you know, not once, not twice, but three times on their way to Jerusalem, that when they got to Jerusalem, that he would have to be crucified and be resurrected three days later. But up, on, up until the, the very last moment, up until the moment Jesus enters Jerusalem, do you know what they were doing? Do you know what they were doing? They were, they were arguing among themselves about who got to sit in Jesus' left and right hand. Right? They were fighting about who got positions of authority and power in Jesus' new imperial government. They thought following Jesus was all about splendor, honor and glory but what Jesus was telling them over and over again which they didn't <coughs> get was that it wasn't about any of that it's about self-denial it's about taking up the cross it's about being last it's about being a servant of all do you think we understand what following Jesus is all about? Do you? We're not that different from the disciples. We're after glory. We're pursuing self-glory. We're just as self-centered <coughs> as they are. We're just as clueless. You know, when Jesus got that request from his disciples about whether they could sit at his right and left hand, Jesus asked them this question, right? Can you drink from the cup that I would drink? And almost collectively, they said, yes, we can. <laughs> yeah. Because they had this false romantic notion of what following Jesus was all about. They romanticized it. <coughs> and then Jesus says to them, yes, indeed, you will drink from the cup that I would drink. But what Jesus was telling them was that they would share in the cup of his suffering. I don't think the disciples had any idea. And from church history, we know that that's exactly what, the, what happened. They suffered, right? They suffered the most horrific deaths. Right? They were crucified. They were last. They were speared. They, they were burned alive. We're just as clueless as the disciples. And part of it is that we're sinful. Full of pride, selfish ambition, self-glorification that blinds us. Just like the ambitions of the disciples blinded them so that they couldn't understand what <coughs> Jesus was telling them, even though Jesus was telling them very plainly. That's part of it. Another part of it is that we're just human. And our understanding is limited, and we don't know what God is up to. So what are we to do? Well, we have to do what Jesus told Jairus to do. Just believe. <coughs> and do you think when, Jair, uh, when Jesus told Jairus, only believe that Jairus wasn't afraid? 
Of course he was afraid. afraid right? Do you think his fears just evaporated because Jesus told him, just believe? No, his fears didn't evaporate. He was afraid. But Jesus was telling Jairus, swallow your fears and trust in me. Now you might think that's the end of the story and uh, there's nothing I, else I can teach you in terms of moral lessons that we can learn. But um, we haven't really plumbed the depths of what this story is trying to tell us. You know, we have to understand something here. Um, we have to understand that these stories are not just thrown together. Right? They're, we saw this last Sunday right? when we compare the parallel passages between in, in Matthew and Mark. Right? These stories are carefully crafted. They're rich with symbolism. They're heavy with uh, scriptural allusions. They're carefully arranged in a specific order to convey a certain message the gospel writers wants to get across. Now, now don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not saying that these stories never happen. Right? Of course they happen. But they're more than stories. They're sermons. Now what Mark, the sermonist, Mark, the theologian Mark, is trying to tell us through this story is this. Okay, this is a main message that Mark wants to convey. Only Jesus can make you clean. Only Jesus can both figuratively and literally raise you from the dead. And that's why you should follow him. Now let me try to explain where I'm getting this. Okay? I'm not just getting this out of my own imagination. It's there in scripture. Okay? It's there in this passage. So let me show you. Is there any significance in the fact that this woman was afflicted for 12 years? Now why do you think Mark mentions that the daughter is 12 years old? What does her age have to do with anything? What is the significance of the number 12? Is it just a coincidence that these stories are related to each other by the number 12? Where do you see 12 in the Old Testament? Okay. Am I being too subtle here? <laughs> okay, H how many tribes of Israel are there? 12. Okay. There are 12 tribes of Israel. What Mark is saying is that Israel is like this unclean woman with menstrual bleeding. Israel is like the little girl who is almost dead. And menstrual bleeding also has symbolic significance. What is that an allusion to? Right? Menstrual bleeding, what is that? Well, Isaiah 64, 6. We have this on screen. All of us have become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Now the word filthy rags, that's a word that translators have chosen to use because they don't want to you know, offend uh, some sensitive readers. But it's really talking about menstrual rags, right? used tampons. Mark is telling Israel, and in a, in a kind of over-the-shoulder way, telling us too, that we are unclean. And all of the righteousness that we're trying to gain through Torah observance are like filthy menstrual rags. This is something that I talked about um, a couple of Sundays ago. What was it a couple of Sundays or three Sundays? Do you remember this? What God is really concerned about is not us trying to be really, really good. Right? It's, it's just hopeless to try to relate to God or get to God by being really, really good <coughs> through our obedience to the law. And here's why. Okay, let me explain why. What the law can control is just your external actions. It can do nothing for the filth and depravity of your own heart. So for example, when the law, the, the universal moral law tells us it's wrong to steal, that doesn't address the problem of greed in the human heart. Right? That doesn't help you to, get, to become less greedy. So even though the law, you obey the law and you don't steal, the underlying problem of the human heart that causes things like stealing remains. And even though you obey the law, you don't commit adultery, the underlying problem of lust in your heart remains. And even though you obey the law, you don't commit murder, the underlying problem of anger 
eating away at your heart remains. And do you know what obeying the law actually does to us? It makes it possible for us to become self-righteous. And look down on others for not keeping the law, while at the same time hiding all the jealousy, envy, greed, lust, and anger and bitterness in our hearts. Do you understand that? It can't give you love and mercy, compassion, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and all those other characteristics of God that are the marks of true holiness. How do you get those things? You get it through Jesus. Come to God through your effort, you get condemnation. Come to God through Jesus, you get grace and truth. And you get the Holy Spirit to cleanse you and purify you and make you more like Him. So in this passage, Mark is addressing people who are afflicted, who are unclean. And he's saying, if you come in and reach out to Jesus in faith like the woman did, you will receive cleansing and healing like the woman did. And you will receive resurrection life like the little girl did. So let's do this. Let's do this today. Okay? Let's go to him in prayer. We're going to take communion. Let's reach out to him in faith. Let's pray. Father, I, I thank you for, um, for Jesus. I thank you for what he has done for us. It is um, through him that we can approach you. I thank you for um, your Holy Spirit, which you have given us to cleanse us and purify us and make us more like you. So I pray that, um, that we will put our hope in him, in Jesus, and that we will stop trying to attain self -right, our own righteousness through our own efforts and to obey the law. And so I pray that you may do this work in us by the power of your Holy Spirit, whom you have given us. In Jesus' name, amen.